So this was a 21 year old male division one football player, offensive lineman at New Mexico state who had an insidious onset of right anterior knee pain, effusion, mechanical symptoms, uh, mostly with flex and extension and a limited range of motion, had no history of patellar dislocation and or acute trauma. Physically 21 years old, six, eight and a half, 325 pounds with a BMI of 36. So pretty large fellow. Uh, moderate effusion, uh, limited range of motion. Range of motion was five to 95. Stable ligaments exam, uh, negative meniscal exam. Did have catching sensation of the patella and some lateral joint line tenderness. X-rays um, on the standing PA bent knee, which is what I get routinely. I didn't get long leg films on this gentleman. Relatively well lined uh, knee. You can maybe say there's a hint of valgus to it. Um, on the sunrise, patel is well seated and balanced, and lateral thing looks pretty good. The MRI uh, showed a full thickness tear of the um, medial patellar facet of the uh, articular cartilage of the patella. And MRI a radiologist measured it roughly a centimeter by a centimeter. And there was also a grade two fissuring uh, along the trochlear groove. In addition, on the lateral side, a lateral compartment, there was a grade three, nine by six millimeter arterial cartilage defect with an unstable flap tear. In talking to this particular patient, um, a couple of things came into play. Um, so first of all, you know, again, I think for me, a lot of times when I'm dealing with these athletes and particularly of a fairly large size and the fact they're in, um, you know, division one football, um, I try to classify my mind to an age group and then their activity level. Um, not only just looking at the size and the depth of the lesion. And so with him, you know, so what are some of the factors that I also consider? Well, one, he's early in his career. He was a sophomore. Um, his initial MRI showed some superficial arterial cartilage defects. Um, he had, it was an impact sport. His BMI is high, it's 36, but he is also six to eight and a half. And um, the ability for him to redshirt. And so there was that ability. So then based on all that information, then we kind of talked about what the options were because I had this time to uh, rehab this uh, athlete and really had a, a year window to get him back is um, kind of the, the bottom line with him. So um, discuss some of the options, discuss the knee arthroscopy, chondroplasty, go in and measure the lesions. And then based on those measurements, um, either try to do something at that point, meaning either a, a auto O procedure and or Macy biopsy after debridement. Because what I did talk to the family about most importantly was that MRI typically will um, underestimate the extent of the lesion. And then throughout the years, there's many times I get in there. Once I started debriding back, and really looking at the lesion, they're often bigger than what they're anticipated um, when you initially go in. So um, I always go in with the thought that I might have to do a Macy biopsy. And then I have those particular tools, um, which I'm not sure we talked about, but you know, make sure I have the curved um, curettes and grasper along with my shaver and ring curettes in order to do a proper debridement when I'm in there arthroscopically. So um, when we did put a scope in this gentleman's knee, what we found was an unstable flap tear of the uh, patella apex, um, which is here. And then on the lateral, front, lateral femoral condyle, we found a uh, arterial cartilage lesion that was delaminated with an unstable flap tear. And then the trochlear of the groove had this lesion, but as I started debriding it back, and sometimes I'll come in and use a shaver, but I'll use a meniscal forcep as well to kind of debride back and then I try to get the curettes in there as I can to try to see how big this lesion will be. And after I started debriding back, these lesions became a lot bigger because there's a lot of pathology there in regards to delaminating tissue. And so the facet of the patella was actually measured at 2.4 by two centimeters. The central trochlear of the groove lesion was measured at roughly a centimeter by a centimeter. And the uh, lateral from a condyle measured at um, two and a half by three centimeters. And I think this next picture will give you a little better idea how big they are when I measure that. And then also I removed some loose bodies that uh, you can see here, did a debridement and then did a, a superior palsynovectomy because he was inflamed there. So this next slide shows the extents of the lesions after I measured them. And as I said earlier, um, I'll have the scope in the lateral compartment, in the uh, lateral portal, then I'll, I routinely switch it back and forth 
as I'm working in order to try to get the proper depth and measure, I'll measure from both sides and I'll try to measure three times. The tip of that probe is about four centimeters. Um, and then you have the lines as you count. So a lot of times I'll count back and forth and then take a look at a few times to make sure I get the right measurements on this particular uh, patient. So at this point, the measurements are, you know, large lesions of the lateral femoral condyle and the patella, and then the trochlear groove relatively small, but still there. And so the question is now, you know, and they're all chondral based. Um, they were not um, bony based. Um, and I didn't see any edema on the MRI in this particular um, gentleman. So having said that, I went ahead and did a Macy biopsy, and then uh, we scheduled him to return back to the operating room roughly about six weeks later. During that six weeks, he did rehab with the athletic trainers, your basic knee chondroplasty rehab, got him back, worked on his gait primarily, making sure he got full extension and flexion, um, particularly because he's big, and um, then working on uh, muscle strength around the knee to prepare him for the uh, secondary procedure. So um, in this particular case, because I had addressed three different uh, lesions, two in the patellofemoral, one in the uh, lateral compartment, um, did a um, arthrotomy incision. And at that time I prepared the defects sharp, sharply with a knife and the curettes as well as ring curettes. But now currently I use the custom cutters pretty much exclusively. I think you're gonna find the proper cutter um, and you're gonna take a nice, it really helps um, with the um, debridement and it, it speeds up the surgery. Uh, much faster than what it used to be using a knife and trying to really get in there and use the templates um, on the back of the uh, suture packets. Um, I get down to subchondral bone. I make sure that I, I debride and remove all the uh, um, pathologic tissue. I get vertical walls. Uh, address the punctate bleeders, as we talked about. I use uh, epi sponges and I use the um, to seal glue, try to stay away from boving anything and uh, really try to get a nice dry bed. So um, after debridement, you should have a nice clean edges like this um, and um, enough for that you can not uh, place your implant. The implant, um, I'll uh, put the, the, uh, the seal glue underneath the, uh, and then put the implant. I use thumb pressure three minutes. If I don't, uh, my, my rep gets after me. And um, sometimes I will put a 6-0 Vicro. I may put it in the corners just to tent it. It helps me sleep better, I, you know, whether I need it or not. It's, it's an issue, um, uh, but I do mean sometimes will that. Sometimes with the trochlear groove lesions, it is hard to get that um, graft to sit, but what I do is I'll put it in that contour of the trochlear groove and the cells do fill up nicely afterwards. So here's the um, in post implant um, pictures of this particular individual. Rehab, okay, so, so rehab. Um, rehab is gonna be dictated by um, your, your, your amount of your, your, your compartments. And so for this gentleman, he's a combined rehab. So he's going to be, what's going to dictate his weight bearing is the femoral lesion. And what's going to dictate his motion is going to be the, the telefemoral lesions, right? So you're going to, it's really going to do a combined lesion. You're going to work in concert. So you're not going to be aggressive in your patellofemoral motion initially because you're trying to not create shear forces within that patellofemoral compartment. And your weight bearing is really going to be on the, um, uh, based on the uh, condyle lesion. So the first three months, I'm really working on range of motion, getting extension. And then around the six week mark, you know, we'll start weight bearing a little more as we move forward. And by the third month, full weight bearing, restore their normal heel to a gait, which I think is extremely important. And then working on some of the muscles around the knee. Uh, when you get after the three month mark is where I think the accelerated um, loading is, is beneficial. And in particularly in sports, it's gonna be sports specific accelerating um, um, uh, loading, right? So for this particular case as an offensive lineman, we're gonna to try to do exercises that are um, specific to him and what he has to do as an offensive lineman. Um, and then you'll see as we move forward with the other slides, is going to work on uh, some other things, but really you have to do um, athletic specific, sport specific, uh, position specific, um, accelerate the load um, as you move forward, but with some caution. Um, and, the, and the reason for this particular one is like, just like in ACLs, what I find is the bigger the athlete, the little harder it is to get them back. So this, this 6'8", 325 pound BMI 36, offensive lineman is going to take a little longer than a small running back and or a soccer player. They're, they're two different athletes. So you have to 
really keep in mind um, the individual that you're dealing with. And then of course, you know, you want to respect cell um, biology as you go through and protect your graft. And then remember you have to do neuromuscular re re um, recovery and neuromuscular re-education. So, and proprioception and bounds. Um, so again, with this particular athlete, we're gonna address his trunk, his hip, his core, um, really treat him as a whole uh, patient, not just his knee. And I think that's also something that in my practice, I do with all my overhead athletes and, and lower, um, and athletes that utilize more of their lower um, trunk to drive for power is that I'm dressing all the kinetic chain and trying to, um, correct you know, all the muscle imbalances, weaknesses in the hip extensors, um, et cetera. And really trying to uh, correct, because I think if you don't, you're gonna, you're gonna set yourself up for problems down the line. Um, and by the six months, we do get him to jogging. Um, firstly, with this particular guy, we got him into the pool, had him work in the pool, and then got him onto the uh, surface, and then started working him um, as we move forward with his rehab. And um, these next videos are at um, 11 months post-op, moving side to side, diagonals, uh, working on high uh, hand-eye coordination. Um, all, all the offensive linemen here get braces. Um, so that, that does help only because um, when you're an offensive lineman, people roll into you when you're not looking and, and blocking. But here you can see his movements and then uh, working here against um, just exhibiting power as he moves forward. Um, so, and then he was back uh, right there, ready for the next season. Macy, autologous cultured chondrocytes on porcine collagen membrane, is an autologous cellularized scaffold product that is indicated for the repair of single or multiple symptomatic full thickness cartilage defects of the adult knee with or without bone involvement. Macy is intended for autologous use and must only be administered to the patient for whom it was manufactured. The implantation of Macy is to be performed via an arthrotomy to the knee joint under sterile conditions. The amount of Macy administered is dependent upon the size, surface in centimeter squared, of the cartilage defect. The implantation membrane is trimmed by the treating surgeon to the size and shape of the defect to ensure the damaged area is completely covered and implanted cell side down. Limitations of use Effectiveness of Macy in joints other than the knee has not been established. Safety and effectiveness of Macy in patients over the age of 55 years have not been established. Important safety information. Macy is contraindicated in patients with a known history of hypersensitivity to gentamicin, other amino glycosides, or products of porcine or bovine origin. Macy is also contraindicated for patients with severe osteoarthritis of the knee, inflammatory arthritis, inflammatory joint disease, or uncorrected congenital blood coagulation disorders. Macy is also not indicated for use in patients who have undergone prior knee surgery in the past six months. Excluding surgery to procure a biopsy or a concomitant procedure to prepare the knee for a Macy implant. Macy is contraindicated in patients who are unable to follow a physician-prescribed post-surgical rehabilitation program. The safety of Macy in patients with malignancy in the area of cartilage biopsy or implant is unknown. Expansion of present malignant or dysplastic cells during the culturing process or implantation is possible. Patients undergoing procedures associated with Macy are not routinely tested for transmissible infectious diseases. A cartilage biopsy and Macy implant may carry the risk of transmitting infectious diseases to healthcare providers handling the tissue. Universal precautions should be employed when handling the biopsy samples and the Macy product. Final sterility test results are not available at the time of shipping. In the case of positive sterility results, healthcare provider or providers will be contacted. To create a favourable environment for healing, concomitant pathologies that include meniscal pathology, cruciate ligament instability and joint misalignment must be addressed prior to or concurrent with the implantation of Macy. Local treatment guidelines regarding the use of thromboprophylaxis and antibiotic prophylaxis around orthopaedic surgery should be followed. Use in patients with local inflammations or active infections in the bone, joint and surrounding soft tissue should be temporarily deferred until documented recovery. The Macy implant is not recommended during pregnancy. For implantations post-pregnancy, 
the safety of breastfeeding to infant has not been determined. Use of Macy in paediatric patients younger than 18 years of age or patients over 65 years of age has not been established. The most frequently occurring adverse reactions reported for Macy greater than 5% were arthralgia, tendinitis, back pain, joint swelling and joint effusion. Serious adverse reactions reported for Macy were arthralgia, cartilage injury, meniscus injury, treatment failure and osteoarthritis. For more information or to view full prescribing information, please go to macy.com.